This is Audible. Dreamscape presents The Guardian by Jeffrey Convitz, narrated by Todd Glass. The Discovery She moved to the basement, telling herself to remain calm. A sound, movement, somewhere ahead. The patient looked wildly around the room. How? They brought her back from the hospital. One morning her nurse was sick and couldn't come in, and Mother was in more pain than ever. She said that if I loved her, I would help her to die. I cried. Then I turned off her support machines and went to school. When I got home, she was dead. How did you feel about this? Guilty. And what did you do about your guilt? I don't remember. You do. Tell me. Agony. Confusion. Then, I couldn't live with it. So? I tried to kill myself. Satisfied, Abrams probed deeper, quickly compiling a dozen pages of impressions. Then, concluding the session, he broke the trance. Within seconds, the patient was lucid. Abrams gave the patient some coffee. We did it! She cried triumphantly. Smiling, Bobby gunned the car up the road and crossed the crest of the peak turning through a short expanse of dense wood into a parking area that fronted a two-story pine cabin and formed a proscenium for a natural amphitheater of trees. It looks the same, she cried happily. He leaned over and kissed her gently on the cheek. I told you it would. She wrapped her arms around his neck and buried her head in his heavy wool sweater. Come on, he said, pushing her away. He rubbed his hands together to crack off the dried mud and then buttoned the parka. I'll get the bags. You take the food. Okay, she said. They collected the bags and packages and carried them up a short stone path to the porch, where he took a set of keys from his pocket and opened the door. Then they pulled the bags inside, turned on the lights, locked the door and threw them. She grabbed the table lamp and threw it. As the lamp cord whipped across the man's face, his eyes exploded with anger. Turning wildly, she raced for the staircase and threw herself upward, falling flat on her face. She looked up. Two teenage boys were hulking over her, laughing, holding knives in their hands. God! she cried. Help me! The boys started down the steps. She fell backward over and over, reaching the living room floor on her side, half delirious. The old man grabbed her by the hair. The boys ripped off her blouse and pants. She kicked for their groins as the old man grabbed her breasts, pressed the knife to her throat, and slapped her repeatedly. Beg for your life, he said. Please, she cried. Rape me. Do anything, but don't kill me. They all laughed. Insane, maniacal, piercing laughs. She quieted, moving her stare quickly from one to another. Then she pushed past the old man and ran to the front door. It was locked. She turned, watched the men move slowly toward her through the shadows, then jumped through the front window, landing face down, cut all over, pieces of glass buried in her body. She pulled herself to her feet and ran across the parking area to the woods, stumbling frantically through the underbrush. Behind her, the men were calling to her, barking death. She started toward the main road. 
She could hear them getting closer. She could feel blood pouring from her body, but she could see almost nothing. Nothing except a soft light in the distance that suddenly appeared. As she climbed over a low rock wall and slid down the other side. The lights seemed to be close by, beyond a few trees and on the other side of the road. Yet, as far as she could remember, there was nothing there. The pounding of feet interrupted her stupor. She looked over her shoulder. The three men were on top of the rocks, staring down, oblivious of the pelting rain. She started to run again, faster, through the branches, toward the light, which seemed to grow brighter, then wane. Yet, that was probably an illusion, a figment of her imagination. Maybe there was no light, only a diabolical trick of nature's elements, a mirage born of desperation. If only this was a dream, she thought to herself, as she stumbled forward, a nightmare that would end when she opened her eyes. Bobby would be next to her, sleeping. The fire would be burning. The room would be warm and safe. If only. She screamed. The old man called her name. How did he know it? She ran into a small gully and squinted in the though expressive. His hands, topped by tufts of white curly hair, lay in his lap, wrapped tightly around two large manila files. He was a big man with a ruddy complexion, the angular features of the northern provinces, and a commanding insular expression reflecting the years of lonely hours he'd devoted to ecclesiastical history under the auspices of Cardinal Luigi Reggiani of the Holy Office and Sacred College. The limousine passed below Trinita de Monti, curled through Piazza de Popolo, crossed the Tiber into St. Peter's Square, and stopped in front of the pontifical residence. Within minutes, another limousine pulled behind. Francino sat silently, his animated eyes tethered ahead. The door of the other car opened. Footsteps approached. Cardinal Reggiani appeared and smiled graciously. Francino climbed out of the limousine. He and Reggiani embraced. Francino felt a crawl of sweat ooze over his body, while flashing those moments over ten years earlier, when Satan had tried to emerge from the bowels of hell. He looked at Reggiani. The cardinal's eyes were closed, his face serene. The Pope's words seemed to fall on Reggiani's ears like music. Of course, Reggiani had never faced Charles Chazen. Francino had. By noon, the Pope had completed most of the text. They'd been standing for twelve hours. Finally, the Pope lifted the manuscript and recited the Almighty's charge to his children. Since man had transgressed, perverting Eden, then man would be given the task of guarding against the approach of Satan. Just as Gabriel had been charged by Uriel, and all such sentinels would be chosen for their iniquity, attempted suicides, not only to guard the kingdom of the Lord, but to, he said, sipping from a ceramic teacup. Yes, very long, he replied. You've been well. Well enough. My gout has bothered me and I have suffered other periodic disabilities. But I've been happy, and I've found peace. If there is more that one can hope for, my poor senses have proven inadequate in the search. I am happy for you, sister. And you, father? Where have you been? What have the years brought you? I've spent most of my time in Rome, at the Vatican. Francino's expression suddenly deepened and the rest in New York. How is Sister Therese? Angelina asked. Francina darted a glance at the files. She is well. May God have mercy on her and protect her. Angelina stared. You've come a long way to find me. Though there is affection... He pulled back the sleeve of his ruffled shirt and clicked the knob of his digital watch. Ten to eight.
She glanced impatiently at the cabin door. Miss Iverson should be here any minute. Don't hold your breath, he advised. Twenty minutes later, the babysitter, a woman of thirty-five, employed during the day in the ship's salon, arrived. Half an hour late, because of a mix-up on the duty roster, or so she said. Since dinner was scheduled for nine, they'd certainly have missed the best of the hors d'oeuvres and the round or two of cocktails. The ship was yawing gently. As Ben and Faye emerged from the aft section, B corridor, and stepped onto the main deck, moving in the direction of the master ballroom. It was cooler than most other nights had been, but then again, they were no longer in the tropics. They could hear the rhythmic thump of sleep, and he thought that that would no longer be difficult. He sensed a wave of drowsiness. Then he heard the doorknob turn. He sat up. Someone was trying to get into the room. Quickly, he jerked out of bed, threw on his robe, opened the door, and stepped into the corridor. No one was there. He walked onto the deck, and following a hunch, walked toward the bow and cut along the swimming pool. Reaching the opposite rail, he glimpsed a man disappearing behind the main salon cabin. He bolted forward along the starboard bow, covering the area where the man might have gone. Then, exhausted, he stopped at the railing, gulping for air, and stood thinking, hands shaking. After several minutes, he turned back toward the cabin. On the deck above was a man staring out at the purple sky. It was Father McGuire. Startled, Ben climbed the staircase to the next deck. Father McGuire, he called. The priest turned slowly. Ben, he said, surprised. What are you doing out here at this hour of the night? I might ask you the same question. I couldn't sleep, the priest said calmly. The air is invigorating. I took a walk and I've been meditating. I see. McGuire touched Ben's arm. You seem upset and out of breath. Yes, I was running. Ben, is anything wrong? Ben nodded, his expression stiffening. Someone was trying to get into our stateroom. McGuire seemed perplexed. I woke up and heard the door latch turn. I opened the door, but no one was there. I walked out on the deck and caught sight of someone laughed through a cough and returned it to Ben. I can't imagine why it was left, but more important, I think it's a waste of time to speculate. Forget it. You're now the owner of a lovely crucifix, and may God smile on you for it. He patted Ben on the back. Really? Ben looked at the priest suspiciously then jammed the crucifix into his haversack as a porter approached and informed them that Father McGuire's luggage had been cleared and claimed. Did you mention it to your wife? McGuire asked. Of course, Ben said. He waved to Faye, who suddenly appeared out of the crowd at dockside. She walked over, holding Joey in her arms. All done. The porters are taking the baggage outside. Ben grabbed the baby. What do you think, father? He asked, holding the boy to his face. Looks just like me, doesn't he? McGuire glanced at Ben, Ben said, remembering it was Sorensen who'd suggested the cruise when they were trying to decide where to go and by what means. In fact, he added, grinning curiously, we've decided to take the same trip again next year. Faye caught the final stages of Ben's enigmatic grin. That's right, she said, catching the rhythm. That's wonderful, Sorensen cried. Everything was perfect, Faye added, including the sun. I can tell. You look absolutely magnificent. But you, Ben, you took too much. Smirking, Faye jabbed Ben with her elbow 
Sorensen cleared his throat and began a barrage of questions. Fay fielded most of them, then asked Sorensen how he'd spent the last two weeks. Doing the usual, Sorensen replied, as he turned the car to Broadway, catching the curb on West 79th. We had several concerts. All right, but if you change your mind, you know where to find us. Of course, at Sorensen's, nine o'clock, on the nose. Good old Sorensen, Max Woodbridge said, laughing. Yep, good old Sorensen. Ben found Fay asleep on the living room couch, her feet draped over the back. Next to her was a half-empty glass of wine. He picked her up and carried her to the bedroom, laid her on the bed, then walked back into the hall, grabbed his haversack, and pulled out the crucifix. Deciding not to throw it away after all, he opened a desk drawer and shoved it under a stack of papers. Returning to the bedroom, he took off his shirt, threw it over the dressing table, kissed the baby, who was asleep in his crib, then lay down next to Faye and fell asleep. Chapter 3 Ralph Jenkins was lecturing the guests on one matter of trivia or another, winced Ralph Jenkins. Some wine? Daniel Batil suggested, holding two bottles high in the air. White, Faye said. For both of us? Ben nodded. Two whites. Batil, who was working his way through graduate law school by tending bar, filled the glasses. Wine and music. Sorensen declared, marching to the phonograph. Something mellow, one of the two secretaries suggested. I got just the thing. Sorensen placed an old forty-five on the turntable and set the arm. Vintage Sinatra. Who's Sinatra? The other secretary asked, deadpan. Everyone laughed, offered toasts, moved around the living room, incredibly cluttered with knickknacks relics from garage sales, and mismatched wooden furniture, and laughed some more. You've just been in Europe, haven't you, Ralph? Ben asked, after Batil had... Jenkins sniffed and rubbed his hand along the base of his nose. I was thinking. About what? About the nun, and what Faye said. That we'd all be better off if we just forgot about her. Left her alone. Oh, Fay's just frightened by the old broad. Jenkins smiled. Yes, frightened. But I think she's right. Ben pressed his face against the cold window glass. Fay, Batil, Sorensen, Grace Woodbridge, and now Jenkins. All of them spooked. Incredible. I think I'm going out of my mind, Fay declared as she bundled the laundry together on the dining room table and stuffed it into the carrying cart. What do you mean? Ben asked. He was curled on the couch with his shirt off, smoking a cigar. Well, not out of my mind, but don't you think that all of this is kind of weird? Faye slid onto the couch. Don't you think it's been something of a coincidence to suddenly have the Catholic Church breathing down our necks? How do you mean? First, we meet Father McGuire on the ship. Then you're awakened in the middle of the night and find a crucifix on our door. I grant you, chance, possibly. But we come home and discover that the Archdiocese not only owns all the land on both sides of the block, but this building as well. And, of course, there's the nun. Now come on, Ben. Those are a lot of coincidences. He groaned and raised himself against the rear of the couch. That's exactly what they are, coincidences. I don't mind playing 20 questions with the neighbors, but let's not get wrapped up in this ourselves. Ben, please. Faye, honey, I'm tired. We just got back to town. We should never have gone to Sorensen's tonight. And frankly, all I want is some peace of mind and some sleep. He stared at her. She bit her lip. Then, glancing at his watch, he said, Hey, it's almost twelve. If you expect to get the laundry downstairs tonight, you better hurry. Okay, okay. Do you want me to help? He asked. No, I can manage, she replied. 
She grabbed the laundry cart, walked into the hall and waited as the lights on the elevator panel slowly crawled upward. Damn that Ben, she thought. He was being a pain, especially since he was well aware of the disturbing coincidences himself. The elevator arrived and the door slid open. She pulled the laundry cart inside. As the car descended, it was silent except for the whir of the mechanism's motor and the swish of wind in the elevator shaft. The indicator ticked downward. Then the car slowed and stopped. The door opened and she wheeled the cart into the cinder block lined corridor. The laundry room was at the end of the building, around a bend in the dark hall. Ahead, Faye could hear the bellow of the huge boiler. Behind, the sound of the rising elevator was barely audible. She moved through the basement, telling herself to remain calm. She hated the place. But the laundry needed to be done, and if she waited for the morning, all the machines would have been taken by the early risers. A sound. Movement. Somewhere ahead. Or was it her imagination? No. More sounds. Maybe another person. Someone else is trying to beat the morning rush to the machines. She stopped, listened, looked around. There was no one there. Hello? She said, as she moved slowly past the janitor's dressing room. A slight echo, but no answer. Is anyone here? Breathing, waiting, and no reply. Everything was okay. She turned the ends of the fingers had been cut off. No prints, and all the teeth have been removed. Burstein glanced at the arm and the remains of the head, then pulled the forensic chief aside. I want this entire basement checked for the missing fingers and teeth. If there's any other way to identify the body, work on it. Scars, marks, something. Don't kid yourself. Whatever marks or scars may have been there aren't there anymore. Frustrated, Burstein turned to Wausau. Where's the doorman and the woman? Upstairs. Accompanied by Wausau, Burstein left the room and entered the basement corridor, now clogged with uniformed police and detectives. The building's superintendent, a Puerto Rican named Vasquez, was seated by the janitor's dressing room. Burstein introduced himself and questioned him. Vasquez provided the names of the building employees and the responsibilities. Then ex You okay? Yes, sir, Byrock replied unsurely. Couldn't this wait until morning? Ben asked as he hovered over them. I'm sorry. If the murderer had any consideration for our welfare, he'd have waited to kill the victim. But the murderer didn't wait. So, unfortunately, I can't either. Now, Mr. Byrock, I want you to tell me what happened, okay? Byrock nodded, then described the sequence of events. Burstein listened. Wausau took notes. When Byrock had finished, Burstein adjusted the handkerchief that sat neatly in the pocket of his sport coat and began to paste aimlessly around the couch. Switching his stare from Ben to Byrock to Jenkins, to Sorensen, with irritating rapidity. Mr. Byrock, I'm told that the compactor is shut off at six. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Who shuts it off? I do, sir. Of knowing. He turned back to the men in the room. They were staring. Who owns the building? He asked. The Archdiocese of New York, Jenkins replied. Burstein turned to Ben. Is the nun in there? He asked, pointing. Yes, said Ben. She's always there. When you leave, look up at the window. It's night, so you might not be able to see very much, but you should be able to barely make her out. If not, you can try tomorrow. I want to speak to your wife's doctor in the morning, Burstein said, after a long pause. I want to know when I can talk to her, and I don't want anybody in this room to leave the city unless we're notified. Understood? The men nodded. 
good, Burstein said. Burstein and Wausau left the apartment. Outside, Burstein stopped in front of the nun's door. He lists learning of the existence of the Sentinel. But that was years ago. It would do him no good to dwell on the weakness of the past. The limousine turned onto 89th Street and stopped in front of an old brownstone, about 50 feet from the excavation site of St. Simon's. Franchino felt a wave of dizziness as he climbed out of the car. It happened every time he returned to the spot. Every time he stood within sight of Sister Therese. McGuire walked to Franchino's side as the Monsignor looked up at the 20th floor of 68 West 89th. The angle was too oblique. He could see nothing. Yet, Sister Therese was there, alone, vigilant. He could feel her presence. The communication was evident. The telekinetics of her power pervasive. He glanced at McGuire, who was also staring at the building. You have noticed her? Yes. This is Gatz. Detective Gatz, with a Z. Gatz smiled, revealing a mouth of beaver-like teeth that stretched across his face and left the impression that the lower part of his head was a huge dental bridge. Please come in, Ben said, noticing the piercing nature of the little ferret's ambivalent grin. It disarmed him. Gatz stepped through the door with an uncompromising stride and an expression steeped in suspicion. I still don't understand, Ben said. Gatz opened his coat and searched for a place to sit. Ben pointed toward the couch. Gatz nervously chewed on the end of his cigar and plopped down on the pillows. I don't make a habit of being too specific on the telephone, Mr. Burdett. You know, wiretaps. Isn't that a bit paranoid, Mr. Gatz? Gatz stares sliced through the apartment. I used to lay them, so it ain't my imagination, okay? Miss Logan returned with her to the building and escorted her through each of the apartments, all empty, except for the priests, which they couldn't enter. Miss Logan left. Miss Parker tried to call Michael Farmer, but couldn't reach him or her best friend, a model named Jennifer Learson. So, she stayed in the brownstone. That night, she woke at four o'clock again. Overhead, she heard footsteps, clanging too. She grabbed a knife and flashlight and climbed the steps to the fourth floor. Halfway up, she stepped on the cat, which had the parakeet dead in its mouth. Then the cat ran away. She entered 4A and, in the dark bedroom, walked smack into her dead father. Terrified, she stabbed him and ran out of the building, hysterical. And that's where I became involved. We checked the brownstone. There was no sign of violence, no blood, and no neighbors. We tried to find Miss Logan, but couldn't. We checked out Allison Parker's father and had his body disinterred. He was rotting in the box. We typed the blood on her arms. It matched her own and could have come from any number of wounds. So, there were only two conclusions we could reach. First, the girl had had a nightmare or a series of hallucinations, which certainly was not inconsistent with her psychiatric history, or she'd actually met the missing neighbors and killed someone. If the second possibility was true, I knew that Michael Farmer had to be involved. Unfortunately, there was nothing I could do without a body. But within a week, we had one. A detective named William Brenner, an underground small-time trickster. He was found in the trunk of a car not far from 89th Street, dead of multiple stab wounds. We typed his blood. It matched the blood found on the girl. I was convinced that for some reason Farmer had sent Brenner into the brownstone, disguised as the loan, Farmer went to the New York Times to find out who'd place a newspaper ad for Miss Parker's apartment. A Times staffer told him that the apartment listing was never ordered and had never appeared. Farmer went home. Miss Parker showed up later that night and said she'd been in a church. Farmer, who admitted to Jennifer Learson that he'd sent Detective Brenner into the house to see if there were any neighbors, 
or if any strange things were happening, suddenly declared that something peculiar might really be going on. They searched the brownstone. They weren't able to get into the old priest's apartment, nor did they find any evidence of neighbors or a murder, but they did find a book. When Farmer looked at it, it was printed in English. When Miss Parker looked at it, it was printed in Latin. Farmer had Miss Parker write down what she saw, then took the scribbling to Columbia University to have it translated by a Professor Ruzinski. He translated, To thee thy course by lot hath given. Bats had gone out for a few minutes and would soon be back. Ben returned to the first floor and knocked on the superintendent's door. A short, balding man answered. A double for Winston Churchill. The man was dressed in a pair of baggy, pinstripe pants and an undershirt. He had a bottle of beer in his hand. There are no apartments available, he said. He belched. And there's a wait list once one comes free. I'm not looking for an apartment, Ben advised. Oh, then you're paddling? The super tried to close the door. Ben stopped it. Look, I'm not peddling, and I don't want an apartment. He paused, thinking rapidly. I'm from the police department. I'm an auditor. He thought that that would have the most impact. I had a one o'clock appointment with Mr. Gatz about his pension, but he doesn't seem to be in. He doesn't? The super scratched his right underarm. He was one of the grossest human beings Ben had ever seen. The super knew he'd been there and he'd given the super his name. The super returned and sat down on the edge of the overturned sofa. He was pale. A hint of saliva lay on his chin. He'd thrown up. I guess Gatz's pension won't mean too much to him now, the super said softly. No, Ben said. Not a thing. The super covered his face with his hands. Ben sat back and crossed his legs. Suddenly, the room was very silent, and they waited. As Ben had anticipated, the police grilled him for over an hour. He told them that Gatz had contacted him on the advice and with the approval of Inspector Burstein from Manhattan Homicide, specifically to discuss the compactor murder. He told them that Gatz had explained nothing at their first meeting, so they would have to call Burstein to find out the particulars. Go ahead. But I want to talk with Burstein, and then I want to go home to my wife, okay? Tell me about Gats, Wausau insisted, from the beginning. Reluctantly, Ben repeated everything, avoiding the specifics of the conversation he'd had with Gats in O'Reilly's pub. That he would reserve for Burstein especially since Gatz had warned him, during the walk from O'Reilly's to the apartment, to say nothing to the police. Wausau pumped him for over an hour, drawing random conclusions about the relationship between Gatz's death and the murder in the 89th Street compactor. When Wausau had finally finished, Ben turned on him angrily. Now, goddammit, he said. I sat in the stinking interrogation room when I didn't have to, and I gave you all the information you wanted. Now I just want to talk to Burstein. I don't think that's an unfair request, do you? No, Wausau said, but that's going as they hadn't laughed in days. Grace Woodbridge passed around the dishes. Ben pulled Faye down to the couch and kissed her. You don't know how happy I am to see you like this. John, Ralph, Grace, I appreciate your staying with Faye today. Maybe it is over. Did he really believe it? What do you think, Joey? Is Mama going to be all right? The baby waved his hands and stretched a toothless smile. Everyone laughed again. Ben stood and walked to the window. Next to it was a typewriter set on a table. In a manila envelope were several hundred pages of neglected text and notes. I want you to get back to your book, honey, Faye said. She sipped from a cup of tea. Yeah, Ben said half-heartedly, thumbing the pages. Jenkins walked to his side. I expect a masterpiece from you, Ben. 
You do? That's good, Ralph. But the way things have been going around here, I'll settle just to finish it. I know you better than that. You'll get back to it, lick it, get it published, and have a hit on your hands. From your lips to God's ears. Jenkins nodded. Sorensen approached. Behind them, Fay and Grace Woodbridge had started to examine the latest issue of Vogue. You might be interested to know that I checked into the identity of the nun, Sorensen said softly. Ben looked him straight in the eye. You did? Of course. I told you I would. Now, don't ask me how I did it. But I found out that the nun's rent checks are paid by an M. Leffler. Who's he? Jenkins asked. Ah, I found that out, too. I have a friend who works at the Archdiocese. I asked him if he'd ever heard of such a person. He said that M. Leffler is the Archdiocese's comptroller. So what does that tell us? Ben asked. Simply that in addition to owning the building, the Archdiocese also pays the nun's rent. We suspected it, but now we know. Faye's voice interrupted them. Hey, what are you whispering about? Ben turned. Nothing, honey. You're talking about the nun, aren't you? Ben cleared his throat. Well, kind of. Really, I told you we should forget her. If Sister Therese wants to sit there, let her. What did you say? Ben asked, startled. Sister Therese, that's the nun's name. How do you know that? She shrugged. Did someone tell you? No, I just know. Ben looked at Jenkins and Sorensen, who shook their heads. Then he sat down next to Faye and took her hand. What was her name be- And what if I did try to kill myself? She said. Her voice so distant she sounded as if she were somewhere else. Would it make a difference? No, I just want to know. All right. Her eyes pierced him. I did try. When I was much younger. He said nothing for a long time. Then he asked, Why? Let's just say I did. I swore that I'd never talk about it. In fact, for many years I repressed the entire incident. Faye, I... I said I don't want to talk about it. Please. I never want it mentioned again. I want you to promise. He waited, then said, All right, I promise. He had the final bit of information he needed to reinforce his resolve to take action. What action? He didn't know. But something. Why don't we go to sleep? She didn't answer. He reached up, turned off the reading lamp, and rolled on his side, facing away from Faye. He knew she was staring at his back. He could feel it. But he wouldn't turn back to say anything else. He'd said enough. Now he wanted to think, sleep, then get up early and get to work. Chapter 10 When Ben left the apartment at 8 o'clock, it was already raining heavily, and there wasn't a free cab in sight. He took the bus downtown on Central Park West, transferred at 57th Street, rode to 3rd, and got off in the face of a driving wind. Crossing the street, he ducked into a corner delicatessen, sat down at the counter, ordered a cup of coffee, then pulled the Madison Avenue handbook from his raincoat pocket and studied the list of New York's model agencies. Some were nearby, a few farther downtown. If traffic permitted, he could conceivably cover all of them in one day. He hoped, though, that that wouldn't be necessary that he'd hit a lead to Jennifer Learson early. But he doubted it would be easy. It had been over ten years. In a transient business like modeling, built on beauty and youth, there were probably few models and few employees of any kind who'd remained in the business for that long a period of time. After a second cup, 
He left the delicatessen and covered the midtown agencies on foot. No one had ever heard of Jennifer Learson. And though there were two or three bookers who could remember a model named Allison Parker, no one could recall what had happened to her. By the time he reached the lower midtown agencies, he was almost convinced he'd been wasting his time. However, one booker at a small firm remembered something about a model who'd been involved in a series of murder. He smiled faintly. It's unfortunate, Taguchi said. We've done just about everything that can be done for her. Though, of course, we'll keep trying. Ben looked at the wooden cot, the simple pine table and chair, the empty gray walls. The cell could have been cropped out of a mid-nineteenth century work of social fiction. I'd like to go, he said, sensing his own break with reality, his giving way to revulsion at the thing that Jennifer Learson had become. Taguchi nodded and escorted him out of the building. At the entrance to the hospital, they stopped. Ben had been visibly affected. Taguchi assured him that there was no way he could have avoided it. No one ever entered the world of the mentally ill without a marked emotional withdrawal. If there's anything else, any new development, I'd like you to call me, doctor. Of course, Taguchi said. Ben drew deeply at the fresh Long Island air. He wanted to tell Taguchi why he'd come, why he'd lied about his familial relationship to Jennifer Learson. But for reasons of his own safety and Faye's, he couldn't say a word. He looked straight at the doctor, lowered his eyes, and sighed. Within seconds, Dr. Taguchi was gone, and Ben was on his way to the Riverhead train station. Ben had been standing on the platform for about fifteen minutes when the grinding sound of wheels on rail chattered through the air. He picked up an old magazine and approached the edge of the platform, being sure not to get too close to the rail pit. The train appeared around a bend and pulled into the station, opening its doors. He entered took off his jacket, and sat in the car's last seat. The train started to move. He s Ben nodded to the second man, who smiled and adjusted the wool ski cap on his head. Is the platform down? Frykowski nodded. We dropped it this afternoon. Have any trouble getting into the building? No. We told the superintendent the job had been ordered by management. Ben walked to the edge of the roof and looked over the wall. The platform was hanging three feet below. He checked the grapnels. They were secure. You sure these'll hold? Frykowski smiled and climbed over the roof railing onto the platform. Turner checked the winches and followed. Ease over the wall and step down, as if you're getting into a hot bathtub. Don't make any quick moves. Okay. Ben said, throwing one leg over the rail. Frykowski and Turner grabbed Ben's arms and lifted him into place. The platform shook under his weight. Just a break point as the line ripped through. Shuddering, the platform broke away and crashed to the street. More lights came on. He started to swing toward the window. Frykowski and Turner leaned out, trying to grab him. They were short. He pushed off the ledge next to the nun's window and jackknifed toward Frykowski, who grabbed his leg and secured his arms. Seconds later, Ben was inside the apartment, on the floor behind the nun, heaving phlegm and racked by tremors. The apartment was dark. Other than the chair in which the old nun was sitting, there was no furniture. Frykowski and Turner fell to the floor. They could hear voices in the hall. Ben recognized John Sorensen's, then Daniel Batille's, and one of the secretaries. Ben caught his breath, aware of what could have been another inch, another few seconds, and he was dead. I thought you said you checked. A tall, Lincoln-esque man opened the door. Mr. Burdett? 
he asked with a degree of certainty in his voice. Ben nodded. Mr. Thompson? Yes, please come in. Ben entered and followed Thompson into the living room, a quaintly decorated rectangle with a distinct air of country charm. Please sit down, Mr. Burdett, Thompson suggested. Ben chose the rocking chair. I can't tell you how much I appreciate your kindness, Ben began uncomfortably. How to begin? Where? I know this is very hard for you, but I had to see your daughter. Mr. Thompson's eyes reflected the agony of ceaseless pain. Please, Mr. Burdett. You are as important to me as you say I may be to you. If there is any hope, I'll use any means I can find to help Annie. Ben nodded. Go to the police, the newspapers, the district attorney in Manhattan. Thompson's eyebrows shot swiftly upward. Do you know what you're saying, Mr. Burdett? Go to those people for help? Let me tell you something. From the day my daughter was discovered in that clearing, the police, the press, the district attorney, all of them have been pointing their grimy little fingers at her, at the girl incapable of defending herself. If you'd like, I'll show you a stack of letters and articles that will turn your stomach. The district attorney even considered impaneling a grand jury to charge my daughter with murder. You're joking. No. They found no footprints, no fingerprints, no sign of anyone other than Annie and Bobby Joe. That was certainly enough circumstantial evidence against her, wasn't it? Ben shook his head. Was she lucid when they brought her off the mountain? At times, them fixated on each other like wild animals. Annie, I want you to come with me. I can help you. He stopped inching air into his lungs, trying to get his breath back. Please, Annie, I know you can understand me. She said nothing. She continued to foam at the mouth, and she was shaking, vibrating, as if her body temperature had been raised beyond human limits. What was going on? Ben considered. A girl locked in a catatonic trance for years, suddenly alive. Wild. Should he wait or run at her? Everyone, please stand back. He could see the crowd moving in. He could hear whispers interspersed with laughter. This is a very sick girl. Please. He started to talk to her again. Behind him, he heard someone say that they were going for the police. But he couldn't stop. She laughed to herself and nodded. Do you want me to put the TV back on? She started to get up. No. I just want you to lie next to me and relax. That's all I want. Now come on. She slid close to him and enveloped his arms and legs, caressing his back with her supple lips. I love you, she whispered. And I love you too. Don't you ever doubt that for a minute. Promise me. I promise she said in a whisper. He closed his eyes and felt his body melt into hers. It was good. Oh, so good. They'd not had each other since coming home from the cruise. He yearned for her, sensed the pain of wanting swirl through his groin. At times like this, he could almost convince himself that the drama he was living was no more than a transient nightmare. Almost. But no matter how relaxed or how absorbed with sensation, he smiled. He had the right Francino. Chapter 14 It was raining when Monsignor Francino reached the roof of 81 West 89th Street, next to the excavation site of St. Simon's, and trained his binoculars on Sister Teresa's window. It was open, but that didn't disturb him. Byrock had reported the platform incident within hours of its occurrence. It was Byrock, too, who'd followed Burdett to Syracuse, seizing the pictures from the dying girl, 
and Byrock, who'd stolen the prints from Technicolor. Joe Byrock was a very useful man. Francino focused the binoculars on Sister Teresa's eyes. The thick cataracts shone like beacons. But as hideous as she seemed, she was a vision of beauty. God's angel blood rushing down her skin. They pulled her to the floor, kicking her in the chest. She broke from the trance. Ben! she cried, seeing him doubled over. She reached for him. One of the boys stepped on her arm and ground his heel into her flesh, lacerating the skin. They fell on her, slobbering, their tongues on her face. Each time she resisted, they punched, until huge crimson welts covered her cheeks. Within minutes, she'd been beaten into a stupor. Ben tried to protect her. They grabbed his head and beat it against the wall. Then they pulled off their clothes and dragged Faye across the room and up against the compactor chamber. Please leave me alone. Don't hurt me. Shut up, you sleazy cunt. Beg, cunt. You're going to beg for all the cock you can get. No, Ben screamed. The tallest boy grabbed Faye's lips and forced them open. He inserted his penis. You at home, and as usual, an insufficient amount of time. I never thought time was a problem for teachers, Jenkins observed, straightening the lapel of his Natalie tailored suit. You know, off hours, sabbaticals, summer vacations, and that sort of thing. I wish that were true, Francino replied. But when you're a tenured professor, the faculty expects you to publish, and that takes long hours of work. What are you working on now? Ben asked, having prepared the question in advance. Francino paused as Batille joined the group. I'm investigating Renaissance religious beliefs in Slavic Europe. Eastern Orthodoxy? Batille asked. In part, Francino replied, but I'm more concerned with the ethnic variations and non-Catholic influences. For example? Well, Presently arranged the reluctant guests in a circle, drew a line across the floor, bisecting it, stationed himself midway, and had the lights turned down. Then he began to mutter in Latin, garbled sounds, gutturally toned, again and again. Slowly, Francino's voice became louder. The echo of breathing intensified, the strain of pumping lungs. The wood bridges together, Ben and Fay facing each other, the secretaries and Batille across from Sorensen and Jenkins. Francino raised the crucifix over his head, increased the speed of his incantations, and started to move. Was the ritual anything other than a deception? Ben asked himself, feeling dizzy, disoriented. Suddenly, Francino screamed, the sound emerging from deep in his diaphragm and dissipating rapidly. Hurriedly, Ben turned on the Get some air in here, Batil commanded. The two secretaries opened the windows. Gradually, Francino drew himself up onto his knees. Though he was still clutching his chest, Ben could tell that the pain was easing. Are you all right? Grace Woodbridge asked. Francino balanced himself and etched a tentative smile. Yes, angina. I've had it for years. It comes and goes. As long as I get nitro, it can be controlled. Why don't you sit on the couch? Ben suggested, as he moved toward the Monsignor. Francino waved him off and struggled to his feet. No, let's continue. Mr. Francino, Grace Woodbridge said. Don't you think you should rest? The strain might... I'm fine, Francino protested. Let's continue. Sorensen and Batille threatened to leave. I don't want anyone to go, Ben declared. Are you crazy, Ben? Sorensen asked. No, Ben replied. 
but I want the ritual completed. He glanced at Francino, searching for assurance. And now? Ben maneuvered everyone back into the circle and lowered the lights again. Francino raised the crucifix over his head and began to mutter and move. Suddenly, Ben felt a twinge of frigid air touch his skin. Where had it come from? The air conditioner wasn't on, and besides, it felt like nothing he could remember. It was as if someone had placed a slab of frozen stone against his body. Francino stopped chanting. Did anyone else feel it? The feeling intensified. Ben started to shake. Francino tried to continue, but couldn't. It's of the sun. Shortly after ten o'clock in the morning, Francino entered his office at the Archdiocese. He was exhausted. A brutal welt marked the crest of his cheekbone. Dried blood colored the ridge of his upper lip. Father McGuire was waiting. Are you all right? McGuire asked. Yes, Francino replied. Was Chazen in the room? Yes. But it failed? Yes. McGuire sat down across from the desk. Byrock completed his investigation. He handed a folder to Francino. Francino opened it. He did as complete a job as he could. There are reports on Batille, Jenkins, Sorensen, Max Woodbridge, and Lou Petrosevic. Everything matches our previous records, except for the file on Jenkins. Byrock could not verify a single fact. Jenkins is our mystery man, perhaps even Satan. He waited for a response. Francino remained silent, reading Byrock's intelligence. But no matter what the conclusion, it still makes no sense. Even if Satan had murdered Jenkins and replaced him, Jenkins must have had an identity before. Francino nodded thoughtfully. What should I do? McGuire asked. Francino looked up. Have Byrock recheck Jenkins's past. And I want him to obtain the birth records for Joey Burdett. The baby? Francino nodded. Why? Chazen can't possibly be the child. The body found in the incinerator was a man's. And how could he influence the sentinel's existence from a crib? Francino turned. <laughs> it does sound ridiculous. See? She said, seizing even his partial agreement. Even you think so? All right, I think so. But that's secondary. What's important is you, that you feel well, that your head is together, that you know you have a husband who loves you very much and is going to see that nothing else happens to you and that you have a son who at this moment is probably crying for his mother and driving Grace Woodbridge crazy. He ran his lips over the bridge of her eyebrows, softly tickling her skin with his tongue. She placed her hands on his knees and buried her body under his arms. There was no light in the alcove. The nearest lamp was fifty yards away, over toward the wall that fronted the sidewalk on Central Park West. They were isolated, perched like two statues, insensitive to the distant noise on the avenue, he asked, obviously pleased. Well, I just spoke to him. I was practicing in the apartment, and he called. He had no idea what had happened here. He phoned his secretary yesterday to apologize for his behavior and absence, and she told him the police were looking for him, and that he was suspected of either having committed a murder or or having been the victim. That's a pleasant choice, Batille said, while chewing into a stalk of licorice. So where was he? Ben asked. I always told you that Petrosevic's eye would get him in trouble. The client Petrosevic went to see the day he disappeared happens to have been a very charming young lady, so I'm told. And Petrosevic just up and disappeared with her into the mountains for, well... 
Let's call it a rendezvous. And he didn't call his secretary? Ben asked. Guess not. Must have had a good time, Batil said, laughing. Sorensen admonished the young law student with Chino raised his hands, a martyr against the power of Satan, his body dripping blood. Jason! A rush of wind and noise. Jason! A mushroom cloud of debris gathering near the wall behind the priest. Jason! And an enormous explosion, like the thrust of a rocket engine that blew down the hallway, carrying Francino headlong through the hall window and out into the night sky. McGuire forced his blistered eyes in the direction of Francino's last cry and crawled down the hall, barely conscious. Reaching the window, he pulled himself up and looked down at the alley. Francino's body lay spread-eagled below. He stood, stared down the hall, and grabbed his face. His eyesight clouded over, seeping black where there had been flashes of everything unholy. And then there a small crowd of spectators shielded under umbrellas had gathered nearby. It was very quiet. Jacobelli, he called. Jacobelli looked over the dashboard of the nearest squad car, spoke into the car radio, then jumped out and approached. We contacted the archdiocese. They'll have someone here in a couple of minutes. All right, they should be able to identify him. That is, assuming he's a priest. Jacobelli narrowed his eyes, puzzled. He might have just come from a costume party. Wausau suggested, smirking. Jacobelli nodded. We covered the building. Anyone see anything? Not that we know of yet. You speak to the doorman? Yes. He didn't hear or see anything either. Wausau unwrapped a stick of gum, rolled it up like a rug, and popped it into his mouth. How'd you like to live in this building? Jacobelli laughed and scratched his shock of black hair. Not a chance. Wausau walked back toward the corpse. The rain had just about stopped, though the sky was still threatening. It was cold and uncomfortable. If you find anything, I'll be upstairs, Wausau said, drawing the attention of the technician, who'd been joined by a second member of the team. The technician nodded. Wausau ambled to the open entrance, climbed the ramp and stopped. He looked back at the body, then straight up above him at the point where the window had shattered. The man had fallen more than 150 feet. No wonder his neck had snapped. Could it have been an accident? Unlikely. Shaking his head, he walked inside. Does anyone recognize this man? Wausau asked as he passed a picture of Franchino's body around the room. Everyone nodded. The clock on the mantel struck nine. John Sorensen stood and cleared his throat. Come into town. Wausau blew a bubble, sucked the gum back into his mouth, and began to chew again. And all of you saw him at Mr. Burdett's party. Batil, the two secretaries, the Woodbridges, Jenkins, and Sorensen all nodded. Did he say anything to suggest that he was suicidal? Did he do anything to make you suspect he might be unbalanced? Silence. I asked a question, and I want an answer. Jenkins stepped forward, drew a handkerchief from his pocket, which he used to wipe his face, then coughed uncomfortably. Mr. Franchino, or Monsignor Franchino, as the case may be, was a very disturbed man. Wausau sat on the arm of the couch, facing Jenkins directly. He placed his hand on his knees and condescendingly asked, How so? Jenkins described everything that had happened at the party. The ritual, the seizure, touch with Gatz, the detective who was in charge of the investigation into those murders. Gatz contacts you. He wants to talk. You go up to his house and discover his body. You then go to speak to Bernstein, who we learn has just died in a fire. Arson suspected. Then, out of the blue, pops a priest named Franchino. 
who throws a seizure during a religious ritual in your apartment and tosses himself out the window on your floor one night later. Now, this is very interesting, isn't it? Yes, Ben replied. The story belongs in a detective magazine. Wausau smiled facetiously. Or in a bill of particulars before a grand jury. Nobody moved. No one said anything for several minutes. Then Wausau stood and walked out the door. I want you all to think about what I've just said. Especially you, Mr. Burdett. Then we'll talk again. He smiled, donned his hat, and left. Like a man's penis. Seconds later, a tall, moderately attractive black woman, about thirty, dressed in a white nightgown, walked into the bedroom, carrying his clothes over her arms and a tray of tea and crackers in her hands. Well, don't you look a sight, father. I tried to clean you up, you know, get all the grime off you. But it weren't easy. I wouldn't even want to guess at what you've been up to. No, sir. What am I doing here, my child? The woman laughed. Child, shit. I ain't ever been no child. And if by some chance I was, I don't remember it now, you know? Did someone bring me here? Shit, no. And don't take no offense at my language. I'll try to keep it clean. But you know, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. McGuire relaxed. He felt secure with this woman, though she was heavily made up and had a jagged scar running from her upper lip to the base of her eye. There was something in her manner that was reassuring. Back, no matter what, McGuire protested. Well, of course, sure, I'll help you. But it won't look too good if your friends see me lugging your ass all over the place. You let me worry about that, Florence. There are many of them that would be blessed if they possessed as much goodness as you seem to possess. Oh, Father, if that ain't the darnest thing I ever did here. Me? Goodness? Wait till I tell them other pussies on the street. Please help me dress and get a taxi. Florence nodded. He touched her cheek gently. When this is all over, I will say a prayer for you. A prayer? Father, that's well and good, but I never did know no prayer that put food in the mouth. He reached for his pants and started to put them on. I suppose you're right, he said. You bet your ass I am. He stopped and stared. Thank God she'd found him and sheltered him and nursed. What would happen now, he asked himself. Whom should he contact? And why hadn't Francino reveal the identity of Chazen before his death. He prayed for Franchino's salvation, yet he cursed him for his discretion. Reaching the third landing, he walked down a long, colorless corridor. His cell was near the fire door, about fifty feet away. The dormitory was deserted. The only sound of life was footsteps on the floor above. He entered his room. Three men were waiting for him, two seated on the bed, one in the desk chair. He'd never seen them before. Father McGuire? Father Tepper asked, rising from the desk chair, after identifying himself. Yes, McGuire answered, puzzled. May Monsignor Franchino rest in peace. McGuire nodded. Father Tepper stepped forward. He was bird's eye maple, and the decorations are transfers in the form of mezzotints of German scenes. Inside are a number of shallow drawers, he demonstrated. Cabinets of this sort were often made as masterworks by craftsmen, for they lent themselves to veneering and carving and were an excellent test of an artist's abilities. Beautiful, isn't it? Ben nodded, appraising the piece. It looked like a rectangular box set on its side, mounted on four legs, but it was ornate and pretty, and far more striking than the bed. Jenkins covered the objects once again. Ben sat on one of the two facing sofas, wiped the baby's chin, the baby was drooling, and listened to Jenkins explain the nature of the forthcoming exhibit, while fetching some coffee and cakes. So what do you think? Jenkins asked in conclusion, 
sitting across from Ben. They're beautiful, Ben replied, admitting that he didn't respond purge, the words Latin. This, then, was the means by which he would learn of Francino's duties, now his own. He wiped the drops of perspiration from his face and glanced at the death mask of his predecessor, which glistened like freshly poured wax beneath the flickering lights of the room's candles. Why was Francino's corpse there? he asked himself. Revolted by the presence of death, could he not have read the volumes without seeing the reminder of his guilt? That it had been Francino alone who died at the hands of Satan? His fingers trembling, he began to scan the lines, reading slowly, realizing he was reliving the dawn of iniquity, the confrontation between God and the fallen archangel. The liturgy spoke of God's summons to his angels, who came from the ends of heaven to hear the Almighty revel in the existence of a son to whom all power would be bestowed. This, drive them into the utter deep. And the Son of God did as his father commanded, driving Satan from heaven. He drove them from the bounds of heaven and into the wasteful deep. Hell received them and on them closed. Hell fraught with fire, the house of woe and pain. McGuire read of the Son's triumphant return to heaven. Then, despite a wave of exhaustion, he released the ties that held the next ten score of pages together. When they opened, he read of the perversion of man by Satan, man's fall, and God's subsequent charge to man, creating the sentinel. He fought to keep himself awake, his body sagging under the hours of strain. He prayed for an end to the torment, but there was more page after page of detailed instructions, the nature of the transition, the entire sweep of numbing across the table, staring icily. You left the crucifix. Yes. And if Franchino hadn't died, you wouldn't have come forward. I can't answer that. I did what I was told. I took no initiatives. Ben leaned on his elbows. I saw you outside the park hailing a taxi. I know, McGuire said stoically. Franchino told me. Ben puffed deeply on the cigar, blowing a billow of smoke up toward the ceiling. How did Franchino die? Felson delivered him. McGuire smiled. We checked the hospital records. There's no trace of a Joey Burdett, or an admission record for Faye Burnett or a payment receipt in your name or your wife's. Then that's the hospital's fault. I'm not responsible for their inefficiency. The baby was born there, and that's all there is to it. McGuire nodded ever so slightly. Ben, are you telling me the truth? Ben exploded. You're goddamn right I am. And what of it? What does it matter where the baby was born? And why are you wasting your time when my wife's life is in danger? McGuire grabbed Ben by the shoulder. Why am I wasting my time? He asked. I think you know the answer to that. There's no way that Chazen can be the baby. Perhaps. But there's a reason why you're lying to me. He released his grip, then walked to the door and turned, staring angrily. Call me if that. I checked further and found a man named Charlie Kellerman, who may have known Seligson. I haven't spoken to Kellerman, but I have his address. Can he help us? I don't know, but he's the only lead we have. Where can I find this man? In the village. Byrock handed McGuire a slip of paper with the address. The address of his apartment. McGuire glanced at the paper, folded it in quarters, and placed it in his pocket. Charlie Kellerman looked up from the cot and laughed. A peculiar chortle, interspersed with strident wheezes and rasps. Sit down, father, he said, forming the sounds with his lips, tongue, and palate. I ain't got no voice box, so it ain't easy to talk. 
and it's none too easy for people to understand. They had to remove it. Cancer. He pointed. There. Pull up the seat. McGuire grabbed the chicken crate that Kellerman had indicated. It creaked under his weight. So, you want to talk to me, eh? Kellerman asked. Yes, McGuire replied. But first, I'd like to put out a light. Perhaps open the windows, too. I'd appreciate it if you don't. Light hurts my eyes. And sunglasses don't do no good no more. You know what I mean? McGuire looked at the man's body. The veins on his forearms were crusted with scabs. His right wrist looked gangrenous. His pupils were hugely dilated. And his ankles, which extended beyond the base of his jalaba, were bloated with water and discolored. Not only was Kellerman a mainliner, but he'd obviously been one for a very long time. You like my place? Kellerman asked, sweeping his arms across the... Kellerman warned. McGuire placed another fifty on top of the first. Kellerman grabbed the bills and stuffed them under the blanket. The next fix is on Jesus, father. McGuire waited while the addict convulsed with laughter, rising and falling on the bed, rapidly exhausting himself. Might we talk? McGuire finally suggested. Of course, father. Kellerman replied, brushing a cockroach off his blanket. You want to ask questions? I got this urge to answer. Does the name Arthur Seligson mean anything to you? Kellerman strained to remember. I'm not sure, he said. The name sounds familiar. It should, the priest prompted. Kellerman withdrew into himself mumbling incoherently, moving his festered arms to his sides. Seven, struggling with his will. A shattering bolt of lightning surged across the sky. They waited for the clap of thunder, but none came. Once more, Byrock grabbed the leg. Suddenly, McGuire's eyes fused shut from the ignition, the hideous flash of lightning that bore down on them from above, its heat searing his face and burning the edges of his clothes. The lightning struck the coffin, incinerating it. Byrock was frozen in position, burned beyond recognition, cremated. Chazen knew. He could not let them inspect the remains. God! McGuire cried, his cry answered by a wild crash of thunder. The gravediggers ran toward the cemetery exit. Half in shock, McGuire trailed behind, rushing along the dirt path and out into the road. Hearing the whine of the car engine, he ran toward it, then moved in. You have a fine son. He should be given the chance to live a full life. There is still a chance for him. There is an alternative. What? You must trust me. Like I trusted Francino? I am not Francino, and you have no choice. You must listen to me and do as I say. Ben stared. Tomorrow night at twelve o'clock, you are to be in this apartment. You will leave with me now. Find a place to stay. Send the baby to relatives. Then return here at midnight tomorrow. Do you understand? Yes, but you must give me a reason. McGuire smiled. A reason? If you're not here, and if Satan does not destroy you, I will, you and your son. Do you understand? Ben nodded slowly. McGuire stared silently. Good, was the last thing he said. Chapter 24 The diocese would send counsel to try to arrange for bail. But so far, it was nearing seven o'clock. No one had arrived. Certainly someone had to come. The transition was scheduled for midnight. He felt like crying out. But who would hear him? The old man who lay prone on the cot behind him? The other prisoners in the cell block? No. 
His frustrations would resonate only in his own ears. Only he could appreciate what Chazen had done, reappearing as Faber Debt, manufacturing the picture of Franchino and him, placing him in an impossible situation. At eight o'clock, he contacted the archdiocese again and asked for Tepper. He was told that the priest had left. He tried to find someone else who might be able to help, but there was no one in authority remaining at the archdiocese. He called the cardinal's residence mouth. After several seconds, he pulled it away and set it down again. You blew the building. Jenkins nodded. People may have died in there. We pray that that is not so. McGuire started to cough. Jenkins applied the oxygen once more. Then, placing the bottle on the floor, he grabbed McGuire by the arm and pointed toward the staircase. This way, Father McGuire, he said. Chapter 25 Who are you? Father McGuire asked. I am your friend, Jenkins answered. Father Tepper, who was seated in the front seat, his attention riveted on the circuitous journey of the car, looked at his watch. Eleven twenty-one, he announced. We'll let you off on 95th Street and Amsterdam Avenue, Jenkins said, staring at McGuire's desperate eyes. Moments later, the car left the park at 72nd Street and Central Park West, and started slowly uptown. You won't answer my question? McGuire asked. There's no need for questions or answers, Jenkins replied. You are committed. You know your duties. When Sister Therese joins her God, Father Bellafontaine must be seated. That responsibility will not change, no matter what I reveal. Nodding, McGuire focused on the hypnotic vibrations of the car. Of course, Jenkins' identity was superfluous. There was only one significance in his life. Sister Therese, Father Bellafontaine, Charles Chazen, Ben Burdett, the transition. He breathed deeply, sucking courage from his gut, carefully reviewing Father Tepper's two he walked into the alley, entered the backyard ramp area, and climbed the ramp to the basement door, which had remained locked since the death of Monsignor Francino, under orders from the building management, the Archdiocese of New York. He opened the door with a key and disappeared into the dark basement corridor. Alone, he rode the elevator to the twentieth floor, the claustrophobic feeling in the car increasing, trapping him the door mercifully sliding open long moments later, releasing him into the hall. He looked around, sensing Chazen's presence, fearing death. Soon, though, it would be over. He opened Burdett's apartment door with Byrock's passkey and turned on the lights. Ben, he called, wiping sweat off his palms. The only reply was the chime of a clock. He called again, and receiving no answer, searched the apartment. They know about some of them, in fact, all except my wife, but they have no idea who committed the murders. The bartender blinked rapidly. He was curious. Sure, he heard a news story every night, but occasionally one came along that was particularly interesting, and this one had suddenly become so. Do you? he asked. Ben nodded. But I can't tell. He belched. His head swayed. Why not? I was sworn to silence. He put his finger to his mouth to demonstrate. By whom? Ralph Jenkins. The bartender poked at his gold inlays with a toothpick. Who's he? My neighbor. What does he have to do with it? I can't tell you. Look, mister, if there's been a murder, several murders, and you know the identity of the murderer, then you've got to go to the police. It wouldn't do any good. It happened. 
He pulled himself to his feet, holding the gate for support. He looked around. There was no one in sight. Slowly, painfully, he staggered into a transit hallway that branched from the subway platform. At twelve o'clock, Father McGuire felt a charge of electricity surge through his body, a sensation that warned of Chazen's presence. He'd sensed Chazen's absence for the past twenty minutes, a feeling that had made him vaguely uncomfortable. But now Chazen had returned. There was no doubt about it. Returned to prevent the transition between Sister Therese and Father Bellafontaine. Father McGuire left the apartment and entered Sister Therese's. He'd never been inside before and had never seen the woman up close. And although he'd been warned about what he'd find, the sight made his stomach turn. The apartment was empty, and there was no light. Who stood near the bed and held the woman's hand, speaking to her softly. The woman screamed, racked with pain. The boy began to cry. Let me die, the woman said over and over. Confused, the boy held her tight. Do you love me? the woman asked. Yes, the boy replied. Then if you love me, disconnect the tubes and let me die. The boy continued to sob, then pulled out the needles. The woman closed her eyes and smiled. The boy left the room. The vision of the woman remained. I shall appear before Father Bellafontaine, Chazen warned the priest, and reveal his sin. He shall see what has been, and he shall know. The room exploded with a blast of cold wind. Sounds grew from nothing. Trembling, McGuire held his hands together and began to whimper, overcome by the horror. The image of the woman faded, replaced by a room, a garage. Chazen stepped back, whipped by the wind, pointing. A boy entered the garage from the rear, the same boy who'd appeared at the bedside of the dying woman, but several years older. And he shall know he is one with us, Chazen cried, his voice as fierce as death. As McGuire watched, the boy closed the garage door, climbed inside an old sedan, started the motor, and pressed hard on the accelerator. Within seconds, the boy began to cough. Then he closed his eyes, trapped by the fumes. The vision of the boy remained. Look! Chazen cried. McGuire battled his will, sweat streaming from his skin, his body shaking. Father Bellafontaine shall know. He shall see both his... Except for the glow of street lamps about fifty feet away, they were surrounded by darkness. Is it midnight? Jenkins asked. Yes, Tepper replied. We'll be late. May God forgive us. A figure appeared in the alley entrance. The figure waited, staring, then moved slowly toward them, footsteps lightly echoing between the buildings. Turn on the lights, Jenkins commanded. The driver hit the switch. The headlights came alive. The figure, a nun, stopped in front of the car and squinted, her features lightly filmed by perspiration. She was black, about thirty, and moderately attractive, marked by a jagged scar running from her upper lip to the base of her eye. The makeup that Father McGuire had seen covering her face was absent. She climbed inside the car. I'm at headquarters. It was called in. You stay there. I'm going. Wausau hung up, dressed quickly, and ran out the apartment door cursing. Something was up, seriously up. An aurora of blue flames, white-tipped, furiously hot, framed the twentieth-floor hall, shielding Father Bellafontaine, who held the crucifix in his hands, the transition complete. Reggiani looked back at the door to the Burdett apartment. Ben was standing silently under the arch.
an unwilling party to a nightmare, dying inside from the pain of loss. You must come, Reggiani cried, cringing from the heat. Ben looked into the void. The armies of the night had retreated, as had Chazen. Ben said nothing, nor did he move. God will forgive you, my son. Reggiani and he had little faith in banks, so most of his savings, kept in a box under the kitchen sink, were gone, too. The sun had set by the time Sorensen wrenched himself from self-pity. He had no family, but he hoped one of the members of the Philharmonic would house him temporarily, at least until he'd settled his affairs and arranged a loan. He would go to Philharmonic Hall first. As he started the car, a cab pulled in front of him. Max and Grace Woodbridge climbed out. Max, Sorensen called. Seeing the building, Grace Woodbridge started to scream. Max grabbed her and tried to console her. Sorensen got out of his car and rushed to their side. Grace was hysterical, trying to climb over the temporary NYFD barrier, grasping at her husband, crying, pounding her fists against her side. There's nothing we could do, Max said, watching her dab at her eyes with a handkerchief. The police haven't been able to find her. Fortunately, the baby survived. Ben had luckily sent little Joey to friends for the evening. Max placed his arm around Sorensen's shoulder. It's incredible, John. Just unbelievable. How will we ever dig ourselves out of this? Sorensen shrugged. We'll just have to do so, that's all. We're lucky we went away, Max observed, swallowing heavily. Yes, Grace agreed. So lucky. Sorensen stared at them. Yes, you were most fortunate. But where were you? What do you mean, John? Max was puzzled. Where were you? Where did you go? Why did you leave town? Max stared at his wife. His expression was blank. He rubbed his chin with his hand, then drew his fingers through his thinning gray-black hair. I don't know, he said. They also returned here after being away for four days. They also went to the police and were asked about their whereabouts. None of them could remember where they'd been. And Jenkins? No one knows where he is. The police found a man's body in the elevator shaft. It could be him. Max Woodbridge shook his head. Four days. Four dead days. It's impossible. Sorensen glanced back at the remains of the building. A dog was rummaging through the toppled wood. Two children were playing with a window they dragged over the barrier. The rest of the lot was deserted. Impossible? He asked, smirking. Epilogue It was nearly noon. The temperature was just over 80, the air dry and invigorating. A yellow cab pulled to the curb on St. Ignacio Street. The land adjoining Father Bellafontaine's sanctuary had been purchased, and preliminary architectural plans had been commissioned for the construction of a modest church from which Father Bellafontaine could be unobtrusively observed and guarded and a successor to Monsignor Francino had been appointed from within the Archdiocese of Los Angeles, charged to oversee the building, secure the safety of Father Bellafontaine, and prepare for the day when a new sentinel would be chosen. We must go, Reggiani said. Sister Florence nodded, content. She'd asked to see Father Bellafontaine, and Reggiani had granted the request. They descended the staircase to the ground floor and emerged onto the front lawn, where they paused to look up at Father Bellafontaine's shaded outline. The focus of the midday sun was directed against the glass. They squinted, 